Hello there. This is a lecture on crustal deformation and mountain building. Some of our objectives include describing the different types of contacts between rock bodies and geologic structures, describe the relationship between stress, deformation, and rock structures, identify different faults and folds, which are types of rock structures, describe the interaction of rock bodies and geologic structures with Earth's surface, and from that create a geologic map. Let's start by considering where we have young active mountains today. These are mountains that are currently growing and getting taller. All along the western margin of South, Central, and North America, we have young mountains that are currently growing. And the, uh, this uh, belt of mountains wraps around the Pacific Ocean. And then all along the eastern margin of Asia and down through um, uh, the Philippines and Indonesia, down, all the way down into New Zealand. And that, as we might remember, is part of the Ring of Fire and exists there because of subduction of the Pacific Plate beneath the continents that uh, are encircling it, hence the Ring of Fire. And then our other major belt of active young mountains are these that trend from Eastern Asia across the Middle East and into Europe, and they include the Himalayas and the Alps. And again, those mountains are there because those mountains are there and growing because that is where we have a plate boundary. So how are mountains made? Well, there is a connection between mountain building and plate tectonics, as I've just uh, reviewed, and as you probably remember from earlier in the semester. But let's get into this uh, more specifically. So in order to make mountains, we need to first deform the crust. Deforming the crust means changing the shape of a body of rock by bending and or breaking it. And this involves using uh, stresses to do this. These stresses that cause the deforming give us geologic structures, which include fa faults and folds. And with enough time and enough deformation, these faults and folds can result in making mountains. We recognize four major types of mountains, included full, including folded mountains, fault block mountains, volcanic mountains, and batholiths. The folded and fault block mountains um, are the two that are the direct result of the crustal deformation that I'm going to describe today. So why does rock deform? And in one word, stress. So stress is when a force is applied to something, pushing or, or pulling something or trying to tear something is applying a stress to that object. We recognize three types of stresses that actively deform rock in a way that rock structures are formed. I'll come back to this in just a moment. Okay. Stress causes deformation. So deformation happens when there's a change in shape to a body of rock. This happens through bending, which we call plastic deformation, or breaking, which is called brittle deformation. Three types of stress do the bending and breaking. Compressional stress, when something is being squeezed together from opposite sides. Tensional stress, when something is being pulled apart. Imagine pulling a rubber band 
you are applying tensional stress to that rubber band. And then shear stress, as you see from the arrows, is when an object is being uh, pulled in opposite directions across the body, in a way tearing it. So why is the crust stressed out? Why are the rocks of Earth's crust under stress? And the answer is, as it is for many things in geology, plate tectonics. The interaction of the plates, especially near plate boundaries, uh, puts stress on the rocks. The stress can be any of the three, but is usually a combination of the three with one or two being uh, the predominant stress. Through stressing of the rock, the rock becomes deformed by bending or breaking, and this results in making geologic structures. These include folds, where the rock bends, faults, where the rock breaks. Go back to the previous slide here. Here we have compressional stress, tensional stress, and shear stress. Fourth one here is pressure, which is also a form of stress, but this is when the uh, stress is equal in all directions. Uh, this would be what a diver would experience if going deep uh, underwater, uh, the pressure is acting on that per, uh, person from all directions. But creating structures in the way that we're going to discuss today, this does not apply. So we're not going to talk about that one. Plastic deformation folds. So bending of rock or plastic deformation gives us something that we call gives us structures that we call folds. And these are always the result of compressional stress. So how do we know when um, a body of rock has been bent? So in answer to my question, we're going to consider sedimentary rocks. Approximately 75% of all rock exposed on Earth's surface is sedimentary. And as we should know or should remember, uh, sedimentary rock is always originally made in horizontal layers. In fact, we call this the law of original horizontality. Uh, considering this fact, we can use the horizontal strata as a reference point or a baseline because we know it should be flat to begin with. But as we see in many places on Earth's surface, especially near plate boundaries, the strata is no longer flat lying or horizontal and has been tilted or bent into geologic structures. So here we have various examples of the rock being bent or tilted at uh, various scales. This last one I showed you being a small scale fold, while the previous one here is on a larger scale and the rock has been folded to the extent that we've built up a mountain. This is uh, similar to the first slide of this lecture, which is an entire mountain range um, composed of 
or uh, an entire mountain range created because of the bending of the rock. So folds have two main names, anticlines and synclines. So in this illustration, this here is the anticline. This is when the rock layers have been bent upwards. I'll grab your lab manual here. There's an anticline. Or compressing the strata can also create a syncline or both. Okay. Imagine if you had a rug and you just slid the rug into a wall, the rug would get all crumpled up and those folds would go both up and down, um, giving us the anticlines and the synclines. The imaginary line around which the rock is being bent is called the hinge. Ruler here. Okay. So the hinge represents the imaginary line around which the fold is folding. So that's the hinge there for the uh, anticline in this case. And then the individual sedimentary beds, in this case, one, two, three. One, two, three. These are uh, referred to as the limbs of the fold. We'll come back to this in a bit here. So here's a nice drawing of an anticline. Many beds of rock have been bent into an anticline. In doing so, the uh, strata has been um, tectonically uplifted above Earth's surface and eroded, as all rocks will experience when exposed above ground. So you might imagine here, if you stare at this for a little while, uh, you can see that this lighter colored layer is continuous, but the gray layer above it is not, but used to be continuous. This light brown layer, same story. And this dark gray layer, that used to be continuous, but no longer is because of erosion. The limbs or beds of sedimentary rock that are more resistant to weathering and erosion stand out more prominently in topographic relief than do layers that are less resistant to erosion um, that are weathering and eroding more quickly. Here we have another example of an anticline. Syncline, same situation, compressional stress, bending the rock, except in this case, the rock has been bent into a U shape. This broad U in the background is at a place called Rainbow Basin, which I've taken students to, as you can see here in the foreground. This is out near Barstow, about two and a half hours from Los Angeles. So back to this illustration here, showing us um, how strata can be deformed over time and then weathered and eroded. So the Sedimentary beds or stratigraphic units, as they can also be called, are numbered one, two, and three. One is the lowermost layer and would have been the one that formed first. 
then the sediment making up bed two was deposited on top of that later. And then the sediment making uh, up unit three were deposited after that. So three was the, of the, three is the youngest of the three there. Then two, then one being the oldest. Over time, the, uh, this block of rock has been deformed into the anticline and syncline we discussed earlier. Then the rock is uh, eroded and the end result is it looks like this. From A to D, that could take 10, 20, 30 million years or so. Some of the uh, stratigraphic units are sticking out of the ground because they're more resistant to weathering. And the dashed lines here represent the hinge um, of those folds for the anticline and the syncline. Now going back over to C here, there's a little more information. And we see the stratigraphic units numbered. They coincide to the original block of crust before it was deformed, one, two, three, and there's even a fourth one that they've added here. So let's uh, take a look at what these uh, numbers mean. We see that with an eroded anticline, along the hinge, the older units are exposed. And as we um, move laterally away from the hinge, the stratigraphic units get older, uh, get younger, excuse me. So oldest in the middle along the hinge and then successfully younger as you move further away. Now the opposite occurs with the syncline. As you approach the hinge of the syncline, the rock units get younger. So you go from older younger, younger, and the youngest unit being right along the hinge for the syncline. And then as you leave the hinge the other direction, the rock units get older. And we always see that's the case for eroded uh, anticlines and synclines. Anticlines and synclines can be further described as non-plunging or plunging folds. So a non-plunging anticline would be one where the um, anticline, the anticline's hinge is horizontal. I'll put the ruler back under here to help make my point. Okay. So this is sitting horizontally. So as the um, strata was deformed, okay, the line, imaginary line around which the strata was deformed remained horizontal. But as we saw in a previous slide, we can see that strata can also be tilted. So if that happens, then the uh, fold is, say, is said to be plunging because the fold axis is plunging into the ground. This would be a plunging anticline. We could have a plunging syncline. And the reason that we make a distinction here is because the plunging of anticlines or synclines, once they are eroded, can make unique rock formations. And as geologists, if things are unique in nature, uh, we want to describe you know, why that is. Why does the landscape look the way it does? Okay, now I'm gonna move on uh, to brittle deformation and faults. So faults are a break in the crust along which movement has occurred. We recognize two categories of faults. Vertical faults, which are also called dip-slip faults. The 
rock on either side of the fall, fault slips along the direction of dip. So I'm going to grab this model I have here. So I've got some wood blocks here that are uh, meant to demonstrate a fault. So the fault is the break between the two blocks. And with vertical faults, the movement along the fault is either sliding downwards in this manner or sliding upwards in that manner. That's the reason that they're called vertical because the movement along the fault is either up or down. The term dip refers to how much the fault surface is tilted from horizontal. Okay, in this case, it looks like about 60 degrees and the fault block is sliding along or slipping along the dip of the fault. We have two types of vertical faults, either normal faults, which are always the result of tension, or reverse faults, which are always the result of compressional stress. The other category of faults are strike slip faults. The fault slips along the strike of the fault. The strike being the direction the fault surface um, is relative to north on the Earth's surface. So for the blocks I'm holding here, If my pencil was pointing directly north, then the strike of this fault would also be north. So that fracture cutting across the Earth's surface, the direction that it's cutting in terms of a compass represents its strike. So in this case, if the pencil is pointing directly north, then we would say the strike of this fault is north. Strike slip faults. They can be right lateral or left lateral. And I'll describe that more in just a bit here. In either case, they're always the result of shear stress. So let's start with um, are dip slip faults. Here we see the lighter band of strata. This sedimentary bed here should be continuous across, but it's not. It's been broke, broken by movement along the fault. And in this way, the fault shows up in the uh, small cliff here. Now, To give a dip slip fault a name, normal or reverse, we need to consider some terminology. So when naming vertical faults is either normal or reverse, the hanging wall and foot wall sides of the fault must be considered. The hanging wall block is the block of rock resting on top of the fault plane. So if my, where my hands are coming together, that's the fault. The block of crust that's sitting on top of the fault or resting on top of the fault is the hanging wall. While the block of crust beneath the fault plane is the foot wall. If the fault was inclined this way instead, which would be the hanging wall? Well, it would be the block of crust resting on top 
of the fault plane. So this would be the hanging wall side, this would be the foot wall side. Using my blocks again, the block in my left hand here, that's the hanging wall block, while the block below the fault plane is the foot wall block. These terms come from minors, so that's why there's a minor in this illustration here. Hanging wall from the roof of the mine where they would hang their lanterns and foot wall being where they would walk. So their feet would be on the foot wall. So if this fault plane were the mine shaft, which was often the case, then you'd actually be walking on the foot wall. Just a little backstory on that. So here we have um, a small outcrop of rock, a small cliff. This person is staring at the fault. And on this, uh, in this photograph, we can see the hanging wall and foot wall demonstrated nicely. Let me illuminate the fault here with this red. So the rock here is resting on top of the fault surface. That's the hanging wall. And then this chunk of crust below is the foot wall. Um, typically, arrows are drawn on either side of the fault to indicate the direction the fault is moving. When tensional stress acts on a body of rock, it can cause the rock to break through brittle deformation. And the foot wall, in this case, will be the block that rises, and the hanging wall, the block that drops down along the fault plane. Whenever the hanging wall is, uh, is the block that moves downward, it is called a normal fault by definition. So my simple animation there, the uh, black line is the fault. The arrows indicate the direction the blocks of crust are moving on either side of the fault. Tensional stress acting on the rock causes the hanging wall to slide down. Again, I'm going to use the blocks here. Incorporate a third block here. So I've got these three guys together and I'm going to pull them apart. And when I do so, you see that the hanging wall block slides down. I'll pull them apart, tensional stress, the hanging wall block slides down. So what I do is I pull them apart, the hanging wall slid down. This happens when we extend or stretch the crust through tensional stress. 